Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. We're going to finish up today. It's 11 o'clock, so today's one of those days. I want you to do this. All right, reach over, get your seatbelt, get your seatbelt, take it over and plug it in. All right, you're going to buckle in because we're going to go fast. We're going to move fast. I am, I am going to, there's a lot going on today, and so I'm going to move quickly. Uh, I've tried to abbreviate this best I can, but I want to wrap this up and not do it a disjustice. I want to, I want to do justice to the Word of God. I want to feel like that's the, this is the most important thing we do is the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And so we want to take that focus. But uh, as we look at this, be ready. All right, so listen fast because I'm going to talk fast. So Philippians chapter 4, and the title of the message today is we finish up our series on joy unspeakable. That's been the idea. The topic of this whole book is joy unspeakable. And we're looking at this morning the secret of contentment. Last week we looked at peace. So the Lord says be anxious for nothing. Don't be stressed out about stuff. And we looked at the way we can do that. Well, there's also a thing that, that doesn't give us peace. And, and so chapter 4 really deals with the secure mind. So if you're going to have, if you're worrying about things all the time, you don't have a secure mind. You don't have peace. Well, listen, if you're not content, if you're living in a state of discontentment, then you don't have, you don't have peace in that either. And you're not going to, you're not going to have a secure mind because you're constantly worried about what you have or don't have, or you're, you're not content with where you're at. Well, that's what we're going to look at today and what Paul is teaching. And that's the last topic of our, of our, our series and what we're going to look at. So from verse 10, and we're going to read verse 10 through 19, and then we'll, we'll get into the message. Verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. It's blossomed again. It's the idea of a flower that blooms after it's been dormant. Maybe the springtime comes and a flower blooms, but their giving to him had flourished again. Though you surely did care, that's what Paul says, you did care, but you lacked opportunity. We don't understand why they lacked opportunity. May not have had, uh, not have known exactly where he was, not have known how to get a gift to him. May have not even known what the need was. But they've come, and, and we'll talk more about that in the message. But they lacked opportunity, but they did not lack care. They did care. Verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. That's what Paul says. I've learned whatever state I'm in to be content. I know how to be abased. And that word abased is the idea of to, to humiliate. To, it can be the idea of humiliating yourself, being humbling yourself, but also being in a state of humiliation. Like you don't have the things you would like to have. It's to bring low. So I, I, I know how to be abased. I know how to be humiliated. I know how to be, how to be humbled. I know how to be brought low. I know how to bring myself this way. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. And that's more than enough. That's in excess. So I know how it is when I don't have anything. I know how it is when I have everything and more than I could hope for. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. So he's not telling them, you know, you didn't need to send me a gift. I, you know, I'm good whether I have or don't have. He's praising them and thanking them for the gift that they sent to him. He had physical needs. He had needs, that, you know, in prison, I'll just share this, in prison, they didn't like... It ain't like prison for us today uh, where they provide three meals a day and everything. They didn't provide anything. They provided a soldier for him to be chained to, and, and he had to provide his own food. He had to provide his own clothing. Whatever he needed or wanted, he had to provide that. So he had a physical need, and the Philippians stepped up and helped with that need, and he's thanking them for that. Now he says in verse 15, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek a gift. Paul's saying, I, I didn't seek this. I'm not, I'm not asking you to give this, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. I'm not interested so much, Paul's saying, in the gift I'm not so interested in, in, in the thing that you're giving to me and what it's doing for me. He said, I'm interested. I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Folks, you cannot outgive God. I'll just say that here. You can't outgive the Lord. And, and when you give, if you give with the right motives and the right heart, he's going to bless and, and, and give back. You cannot outgive him. He's going to provide for your need. Indeed, I have all and abound. 
I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, I just pray, God, you'll take these next few moments and, uh, again, you'll guide my thoughts and my speech. Lord, you, you've prepared this. You've, 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 you've guided me in the preparation. But, Lord, I pray now you'll guide and you'll bless in the presentation. And that, Father, what I preach and what I say will be what you won't share. Bind my mouth from speaking what you don't want me to share. And, Lord, I pray you'll bring things to mind that, Lord, you do want me to share that maybe aren't in these notes that you, that, as we prepared. So, Lord, just, just bless now. Use this. And, Father, for any of us in here who are struggling with, in this area of discontentment, Lord, we're just not happy. We're not content with what we have, what you've given us. Lord, help us this morning. Help us to learn how to be content with the things that we have. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we find the subject of our message this morning in verse 11. It says, now that not, he says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, contentment is not complacency. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about just being complacent and not trying to do anything to better yourself. You know, I have a job. It doesn't pay enough. Contentment is praising God. You've got the job. But, it, but, it's, but it's not a complacency that says, well, I, I couldn't do any better. I'm not going to try. You know, we should always try. We can, we can try to improve things. But contentment is not complacency, nor is it a false peace based on ignorance. Well, I'm ignorant. I just don't know about this stuff. So, you know, I have this false peace that everything's just wonderful. It's not that. It's not putting on a false peace. A complacent believer is unconcerned about others. See, there's the problem. When we're as a believer, when we become very complacent, not, not talking about contentment, talking about complacent. You know what? We, we, we lose concern for other people. While the contented Christian wants to share his blessings. A Christian who understands has become content with what he has. Man, we, we can understand, you know what? I may not have a lot, but I can give to somebody else. I can still be a blessing and, and the way the Lord leads us. So contentment is not escape from the battle, but rather an abiding peace and confidence within the battle as we, as we go through this life. And there's two words in this verse that are vitally important to understanding this verse. The first, well, the two words are this. They're learned and content. Learned and content. So one meaning of the word content is, is the, 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 the word contained. Okay, it's contained. To be it, it captured within something. So to be content. And it is a description of a man whose resources, listen, his resources are within him so that he does not need, uh, d does not have to depend on an outside substitute. So the idea is everything that he needs to be content in that idea is within him. You'll understand where this comes from here in, a, in, a, in just a moment. So this word speaks of being satisfied with what one has, regardless of how small it might be. Now, there's three definitions. You look up in, in, in uh, you actually look up in the Strong's Concordance. There's three definitions for this word content. The first is this, sufficient for oneself, strong enough or possessing enough to, to need no aid or support. Now, that could be, you know, that's this idea of maybe self-sufficiency. Now, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about, well, I'm a Christian, so, you know, I'm just going to do it in my own strength. That's, that's sinful, to be self-sufficient. That's not the idea of what this is saying. The second definition is independent of external circumstances. So when you're, con when you're content, it is independent of what's going on outside of you. Paul could be content in a prison or, or at a party. He could be at a feast and be content. He could be content in that prison. He could be content where he was, chained to a Roman soldier in need of things physically, but he was content and he had peace. He wasn't, he wasn't, the circumstances around him didn't determine whether he was content or not. The third one is contented with one's lot, with one's means, though the slenderest. So even if you don't have a lot, being content says, you know, what I have is enough. It's great. Are you, are you a contented person? Are you satisfied with your lot in life? And that's what I want you to think about this morning. Am I content with where God has me, what God has given me, what God has done for me? Am I content with that? Or, or am I discontented? Am I upset? Am I unsettled because I don't have certain things or things aren't going my way? The circumstances aren't as I would like them. Because this is what Paul's trying to teach us today is to be content with where God has us. If you are content, then you possess great treasure. First Timothy 6.6 6 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. 
When we as a believer, man, we're walking with the Lord and, and, and we are content, man, that is great gain. It's a great place to be when we are content. Someone said that contentment softens our privations. Now, some people go like, what is that? I had to look it up. So some people go, I don't know what that word means. I didn't really understand what the word means, so I looked it up. And it, and it means that when we don't have the necessities of life. So imagine... Well, it's where Paul is right now. He's in privations. He, he is being chained. They're not providing his meals. They're not providing co cover for him when it's cold. They don't give him a soft bed. He, anything that he needs, someone else is going to have to help provide. That, that would be what the, this idea is. So he's in, he's, he's in privation. He doesn't have the basic necessities of life even at this point. So someone said, again, that, that, uh, that contentment softens our privations. So even when we don't have at all, it softens that. It sweetens our provisions. So the things that we do have, the things that God has given us, the things we're blessed with, man, it's even sweeter when we're content and makes, listen, and makes a cottage as fair as a castle. See, contentment says, I don't have to have the, the house the Joneses have. I don't have to have the mansion. Man, one time, I'm going to chase a rabbit right here, but I want to make the point. Anybody ever heard of Amway? Raise your hand if you've heard of Amway. I hope I don't have any Amway distributors in here. I'm not going to make you happy right now. But I had a guy, and when I was working at UPS, I had a friend that, that was working there with me. He was a driver, and he was trying to get me to do Amway, trying to get me involved with Amway. And so they do this thing to get you, to get you interested in doing Amway. They do this thing where it's called dream building. It's dream building. So the guy picks me up, and it was a, uh, this guy owned a Ford dealership, and he's doing Amway. You know, he owns a Ford dealership. But he, and so my buddy and this guy picked me up, and we go ride around, and they go ride through these fancy neighborhoods with these big old houses, dream building. You know what they're doing? They're trying to make you discontent with where you are. That's right. They're trying to entice you with the things of the world. And it's a, that's a... Supposedly, I thought the, the owners of that are a Christian, or, or, it's a Christian group. But that is not very Christian when you start trying to sow discontentment in someone's heart to make them then, well, I'm going to lust after and have greed after what, what I don't have and what dream building. It's called discontentment building is what it's called. We live today in a world of discontent people. There, there are many believers who have much and still are not content. How much is enough? You know, we, we think the world, uh, uh, I think it was Ted Turner years ago, had all his millions, and someone asked him, what's it, Ted, what's it going to make to make you happy? He said, another million. I think it was uh, one of those other guys years and years ago had just, today's money was like $800 billion, I read. And someone asked him, what's it going to take to be enough? And he said, a little more. $800 billion worth of wealth at that time in today's money wasn't enough. Eight hundred. Well, that's why these guys are still chasing money when they have billions and billions and billions, because they're not content. Did you, realize, uh, did you realize that the poorest of the poor in America are among the richest in the world? It's truth. How many of you have ever, how many of you have, raise your hand if you've never been out of America, never been out of this country. Raise your hand. You've never left this country. Raise your hand if you've been out of the country. Let me see that. Okay, wow, all right. That's, that is much higher than I anticipated, which is good because if you've been to, if you've been to third world, you understand how blessed Rob, we understand, you understand how blessed we are, right? We've talked about that. Rob saw things where he was in Africa that may, if you've not seen that, you come back here and I've heard people that were in the mission field who come back to America and they go to the grocery store and they're overwhelmed. It's, it's like culture shock. They're like, this is this sensory overload. You know, we had two choices for, for something to eat for breakfast, and you've got 5,000 choices for cereal in a box on the aisle. It's overwhelming. We are, you know, if you are the poorest of the poor in America, you're among the richest in the world, okay? Rather than living lives of grateful contentment, our lives are often filled with complaining. We complain about our children, that they're too loud instead of being thankful that they're healthy, happy, and of sound mind. We complain about our home when millions have no home. Uh, we gripe about work when many have no job. We fuss about our vehicle when there's multitudes who have never even seen a car. We complain. Why? Because we've never learned the secret of contentment. Benjamin Franklin said, contentment makes poor men rich. Discontentment makes rich men poor. It's amazing. 
The verb, now the verb, that's content. Now the verb learned means, when Paul said learned, it means learned by experience. So Paul's spiritual contentment was not somehow, it wasn't something that was given to him at salvation. He got saved and man, now he's filled with the Spirit and he's instantly, he's just a content Christian in every area. Paul says, look, I've learned this. I had to learn that, which tells us that there's something we all have to learn. We have to learn to be content. And he had to go through many difficult experiences in life to learn how to be content. And we see in his own words in verse 11, he says, I have learned. It means to gain knowledge or understanding. In verse 12, he says, I know. This, means, uh, this word means to understand, to make a discovery. In verse 12, he also says, I am instructed. And this phrase means to be initiated or to teach. And one person said that Paul had been initiated. It's the word there that the Stoics use. You were initiated when you became a Stoic. You were initiated into these deep deeper mysteries, you know, on the, on the stoic side. And they didn't, they didn't let anything outside bother them. They didn't acknowledge anything and nothing moved them. And their hearts became cold and hard and, and they were just a desert place. And they acted like, well, we don't care. We don't allow. That's not what God's ta- or Paul's talking about here. But he has been initiated. He has been taught how to be content in whatever situation he's in. He's had to learn this. So in this chapter, Paul named the spiritual resources that can give us contentment. Now first, there's two things we're going to look at. I'm going to break them down into different things. But the first is this, if you're taking notes, it's the providence of God. If we're going to be content, we need to understand the providence of God. So point A is this, rejoice in what God provides. You got to acknowledge it's from God. Okay, verse 10, Paul says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now, if Paul didn't understand this was a gift from God, he would have just said, I rejoice in you Philippians. I praise you for your your goodness and your generosity. And he, he did that. He was thankful for that. But he understood where it came from. Where did that mind come from? Where did the the idea for them to give out of poverty to give to help him? It was came from the Lord. So he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. So the Philippians gave aid, but Paul understood that it was from the hand of God. That's why anything that we you find a ten dollar bill, it's if it's you find it, it's a it's God's provided that. You have a job and you work. You didn't do that. I'm going to do, I'm going to do my, who was it? You know exactly where I'm going, don't you? Was it Biden? You didn't do that. Or one of them, one of them said, you didn't do that. You didn't do that. Um, maybe he's true. Maybe that's right in one sense, but not in right in the sense he thought. But here's the deal. If you got a job and you got the ability to have a job, where'd you get that? God. So we got to understand the things that we have. Rejoice in what God provides you, okay? The second is be satisfied with what you have. Be satisfied with what you have. 1 Timothy 6, verse 7 and 8. For we brought nothing into this world, and it, and, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. You know, we don't have to have a swimming pool to be content. You ain't got to drive the newest car. You ain't got to have the newest iPhone. Believe me, folks, listen to me. I'm going to help you here. If you don't have the latest version of the iPhone, it'll be okay. (laughs) It'll be okay. Your iPhone 8, I don't know how many generations ago that is, it'll still make phone calls. You'll still get more than you want in, in there, okay? So... You don't have to have the latest gadgets, the latest this, the latest everything. You ain't got to have the nicest car. You don't have to have those things. Be content with what you have. Many are not content to keep up with the Joneses. They want to they be the Joneses. You know? Instead of complaining about what you don't have, try praising him for what you do have. There's a story about an elderly Christian lady, and, and, and here's the deal. The lady, all she had, all she had was bread and water. Here's what she said. All this... And Jesus too. That's the right attitude, amen? That's the right attitude. Verse 12, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Whatever circumstance Paul was in, he, he, he understood it and he was satisfied and he was content where he was. Uh, the third point, C. Number C. Number C. Letter three. Remember, remember God knows our needs. You got to remember that. He knows our needs. We sometimes act like he doesn't understand what we need. Mark, Mark, not Mark, Matthew 6, 31. Therefore, do not worry. Again, here's this theme of not worrying and, and it's worrying about stuff. Therefore, do not worry saying, what shall we eat? 
What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. God knows what we need. Understand that. He, he's not up there going, oh, I wonder, I wonder what Conrad down there, I wonder what he needs. Hey, maybe I can get him to send me a, a Christmas list. I don't know what he'd like this year. I don't know what he wants. You know, it's not like that. God knows and we've got to understand that. So the next point is this. God will meet our needs in unusual ways. If you're a child of God, he's going to meet your need. He knows what your need is. Okay, And he's going to meet it, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You need food, you need shelter, you need clothing. He'll add that. He's going to provide those things for you. Anybody in here ever missed a meal? Not, I mean, by like you just, it was not like by, did you get in trouble? Got sent to bed with no meal. Oh, it's so terrible. Life is so hard. I doubt there's anybody in here who's ever missed a meal because you just did not have anything to eat. I'm going to tell you this. When I was a kid, I remember, I remember we, we, weren't, we weren't super wealthy or anything, but there were times where we, I would eat a wish sandwich. And you know what that is? That's where you have two pieces of bread and you wish you had some meat. That's a wish sandwich. But we seriously would eat mayonnaise sandwiches because we didn't have anything else to put in it. We just put mayonnaise in there and that was what you ate. And uh, you know what? But I never, we never went hungry. Never went without. God provided. That was even before I was a believer. God was taking care of me. Um, and so he's going to meet our needs in unusual ways. He may meet them. He may meet those needs using nature. Go back and read 1 Kings chapter 17. And you see Elijah and God sent ravens to feed him. He's there and he's depressed and, and, he, and he's wiped out emotionally, spiritually, physically. He's just, he's just done. And God provides for him. He sends ravens to feed him. And, he, and, 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 and God sends to the, the Israelites. He sent quail in the evening and manna in the morning. He provided. He used nature to provide their need. The second thing he may do is he may meet our needs through others. If you read on in 1 Kings 17, then Elijah, after he comes back to strength and he gets his, he gets his, his head right and his heart right and everything, then God sends him to Zarephath. And he goes and there's this widow there. And she's down to nothing. And God uses Elijah to, to meet the needs that she had. So God now uses another person. And God may meet others' needs through you. You ever had a situation where God put on your heart that, man, you know, I just feel like we ought to do something for them. I tell the, I've told this story before, and I do not say this to brag in any way, understand this. But Gene and I had come back from Charlotte, North Carolina. We had a friend who was in ministry. And you remember this, sitting in Grove Level. And I leaned over to her and I said, I feel like we ought to give this couple, um, we ought to give them some money. I just feel like we ought to do that. And she said, yeah, I think we ought to do that. I think we have, I feel like that too. And I said, well, i tell you what, you write down a number, and I'm going to write down a number, and we'll see where we're at. Well, I wrote down a number, and she wrote down a number. And it, you remember this now? What, was it the same or different? It was to the penny. It was the same number. And God's honest truth. And so we wrote them a check for that, that amount, gave it to them there at church. And uh, later that afternoon, I got a long email from him. Is Mark, is Mark in here? That's what your dad was talking about yesterday, where it just, whoo, it just hits you. Um, but he sends me this long email, and he says, I want to I explain it. He said, thank you for the gift, but I want to explain this because I believe one day you're going to be in the same situation in ministry, and you're going to have needs. And he says, here's, here's the deal. We've known for weeks now, we work on a budget. We knew for weeks now we were going to be X dollars short in our, in our budget. We weren't going to have the money. We would not have the money, and it was to this amount that we were short. And he told me the amount, and it was exactly what we wrote the check for. And he said, this is how God works. And he provided that need. And uh, others you've experienced, you've been, you've been maybe on the end of giving and meeting someone's need. Maybe you've been on the end of someone else meeting your need like Elijah did. But if God tells you to do it, listen, if God tells you to do it and puts on your heart to do it, then do it. Then be obedient to what God says. There are a lot of times I don't give money to people who are begging on the, the streets. I don't, I don't do that. You come out of a convenience store and someone's sitting there begging. And I typically I won't do that. Come out of a store one day. I walked in. The guy was sitting there. He wasn't asking for anything or anything. But I go in. I bought what I bought. And I come out. And as I come out and I walked away, I went, mm, I feel like I need to do something. And I turned around and I took him some money. And he went into church service. He just went to praising. 
And I left there more fired up and charged up than, than I mean, I was far more blessed than he was because he was sitting there. But he said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asking and begging people for stuff. I'm, I'm trusting God to provide. And, and, and God used me in that. And it was, it was an encouragement to me. So when the Holy Spirit lays on your heart to do something, do it. Galatians 6, 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Let us do good to all, especially those who are in the household of faith. All right, and then another point here is, is this. Remember the promise of God. God has not promised to supply all your greeds, okay? God's not promised to provide all your greeds, but he has promised to permit and, and provide all our, our needs. He's promised to do that. Verse 18 and 19. Again, we'll read these. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am, I am full. I have received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, which uh, well-pleasing to God. He sees that as a sacrifice. He sees them almost like priests who have, have offered a sacrifice on the altar, and it's a sweet aroma. What they have given was a spiritual sacrifice. That's what he's acknowledging. And, and it's, it's to their they're benefited even in that. But he's praising them for that. But look at verse 19. And he says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now there's an interesting contrast between verse 18 and 19. And if we're going to paraphrase these two verses, you might write it like this. You met my need and God is going to meet your need. You met one need that I have, but God will meet all your needs. You gave out of your poverty, but God will supply your needs out of his riches in glory. So the church there at Philippi, they had entered in, in, into an arrangement of giving and receiving. And uh, so the church, they gave materially to Paul. They gave materially to him and they received spiritually from the Lord. They were blessed but far beyond anything they could have given, they were blessed spiritually. In our day of such scientific achievement, we hear less and less about the providence of God. Many have this idea that the world is this vast natural machine that even God himself can't interrupt in, into its workings. But the word of God clearly teaches the, the providential work of God in nature and in the lives of his people. Now, the word providence comes from two Latin words, the first being pro, which means before. So before, and the, the other word is video. Any idea what that might mean? Anyone? Anyone? To see, it, it, that's exactly what it means. It means to see. You see a video, right? You see a video. So it's before to see. So God's providence means that God sees it beforehand. But it doesn't mean that God simply knows beforehand because providence involves much more. It is the working of God in advance to arrange circumstances and situations for the fulfilling of his purpose. Does that make sense? So it's not that just God, listen, God is above time. God, time is a part of his creation. Okay, so he's above time. He's, he's outside of time. He's not contained in that. So does he, does, how does he know the beginning from the end? He already sees it. He already knows what's there. But it's more than him just seeing it and knowing it. God is at work. When you talk about God's sovereign hand in your life, it, it's at any one moment he's moving a million things in your life and those around you. He's manipulating these things. And you you, you, your friends then, he's working all of those things in their life. That's God's sovereignty. He's given us free will. But it's kind of like I was explaining in class this morning. We're talking about this. It's like playing chess. If I play a chess master, I have free will. I can choose any piece I want to choose. But I'll promise you in about three moves, he'll have me moving the pieces he wants me to move exactly where he wants me to move them. Because he knows how to work the board. Does that make sense? That's what God's doing. He's working in these things. So, so when you talk about when you talk about foreknowledge, you know, God is outside of time, so He He has seen it. But it's more than that. Providence, God is in the present. The, the idea would be that, like, He's with us right now in the present, and He's working to make things happen according to His will in the future. Preacher, help me understand that. All right. How about this? How about Jonah's whale? Wow, what an incredible circumstance that Jonah's off the boat and all of a sudden this fish gets him. How many of you have ever been swallowed by a whale? If God, if that's part of his plan, he'll have that whale there when you jump in the water. 
Okay, that's what happened. God had already orchestrated that and had the well there to fulfill his purpose. How about Peter's fish? You know, the Lord sends Peter, says, go catch a fish. And Peter's got to be thinking, well, I love that Peter went and did it, but he's got to be thinking, what's this got to do with paying a tax? I'm going to go catch a fish? So what does Peter do? He goes fishing. He catches a fish. He pulls the fish in. What's in the fish's mouth? Wow, what an amazing circumstance. That's just wild. Gee golly, that's great. No, God had worked. And you imagine that. Christ knew what he was going to do. So at some point, he put the fish. He, he had someone throw a coin in. He had the fish catch it. He had the fish swimming around, living life. All of a sudden, and Peter's going down. He says, I want you over there at that time. Peter goes down. He throws the hook in. He hits the hook. He brings it up. There's the coin. That's the providence of God. How about, you can think about Jesus' donkey. We'll talk about him next week. That donkey, never been ridden. Exactly where he was. Jesus hadn't scoped it out and said, you know what? I think I'll go tie a donkey up over there. Well, he did that, but he didn't do it. You know, he made it. He, he arranged all of that for that donkey to be exactly where it was. He tells his disciples, you go over there. You find a donkey that's never been sat on. And if somebody says something to you, just tell them the Lord needs it. The Lord has need of it. And you go get that donkey. He arranged all of that. That had already been orchestrated. That's God's providence. The story of Joseph helps us to understand this. You know, here's Joseph and his brothers, and his brothers envied him, and they sold him as a slave. And when he was 17 years old, he was taken to Egypt as a slave, and then later in prison for false charges. And there God revealed that seven years of famine were coming after seven years of plenty. It was, it was uh, through Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams that this fact was discovered. Because of that, Joseph was elevated to the position of second in command in Egypt. After 20 years of separation, Joseph's brothers were reconciled to him, and Joseph came to understand what the Lord had done. He worked all of those things. And you know what's amazing? Joseph is my Old Testament hero. Other than Jesus, I don't know of anyone in Scripture that I admire more than Joseph. Because when you read about Joseph and the things that happened to him, unlike me, who can complain because, you know, I, I stumped my toe, I can complain about everything, I don't read anywhere where Joseph complained. His brothers betray him. He's thrown in a pit. I don't hear him complaining. It's not recorded. We don't hear him whining and complaining as he's being hauled off to Egypt. We don't hear him whining, whining and complaining when he's in Potiphar's house as a slave. And as a servant. And then he's lied about it. We didn't complain and whine about that. He's thrown into prison for that. We don't hear him whining and complaining. You just see him being faithful to God. Now, I don't think he, he didn't fully understand because we see it later on, but I don't know that he fully understood that, that at that point. But Joseph later, in chapter 45, verse 5, he says, God sent me before you to preserve life. God worked all in that. To save their lives. Genesis 50 verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. That's the providence of God. His ruling hand and his, his hand ruling and overruling in the affairs of our lives. He, he, and he works these things. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, uh, to those who are the called according to his purpose. We know that all things work together for good. How do they work together for good? Because God's working them together for good. It's his hand that work in those things. It's not just that inanimate objects are all of a sudden now they got a mind and they're thinking how they can work in our lives. Yeah, this, this block's going, you know what? If I trip him right now, then I'll keep him from falling and breaking his leg later. So I'm going to... No, that's not how God can work those things, but an inanimate object's not. So the things that are being worked together for good are being worked together for good by God for our good. God in his providence had caused the church at Philippi to become concerned about Paul's needs, and it came at the very time Paul needed their, their help the most. How did God work that? He touched their hearts, says, hey, Paul needs some help. They began to move then. They, they had been concerned, but they had lacked opportunity. Many Christians today have opportunities, but they lack concern to help. Life is not a series of accidents. It's a series of divine appointments. And that's what we've got to understand. 
We go through thinking, man, this is just an, an accident. It's just a strange set of circumstances. Folks, you've got to learn to see God's hand in the things that go on in life. And when we do that, you know what? Then we don't end up complaining about everything. We don't get upset when things don't go our way because we understand God's doing something in us. I've heard it again and again and again. Somebody loses their job and they go, you know what? I'm not going to be, I'm not, I don't like it. I'm not happy about it, but I'm not going to fret it because, and I believe this, when God shuts a window, he opens a door. Amen. I've heard testimony after testimony here where somebody lost their job and a week later or two weeks later had a better job, better pay. You guys, better pay, better job, better situation. Just God takes, takes care of us. Psalm 38, uh, 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. He's watching as he's working. Abraham called God Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide or the Lord will see to it. That's why if he makes a promise, you can trust his promise. And he's going to make it happen. This is the providence of God. And that is a wonderful source of contentment. When we understand how God provides and he looks out for us and protects us and, and he provides for our needs, man, that brings great contentment. The second is this. Second is this, is the omnipotent power of God. Uh, again, looking at verse 11 through 13. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. In verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, understand the context of this passage is contentment. Okay? And what we're talking about is Christ's power, not my power. It, 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 it was the power of Christ within Paul that gave him special, uh, the, this, this special spiritual contentment and the ability to be content in any circumstance. Paul was dependent on the power of Christ in his life. And his motto was, I can through Christ. Okay, We see that I can do all things. And I'm telling you, man, but this, is, this may be the most abused scripture in all of the Bible. It's the Superman verse. And I, I was thinking about it. I was, I was Saturday, uh, no, it was Friday afternoon. I flipped on and I was watching a little bit of a basketball game. And uh, this guy was sitting there and he had a cross on his cross tattoo on his arm. And, and it had Philippians 4.13. And I said, I hope he really understands what that means. But I doubt it. I, I doubt it. Probably because he put, the, put it on there because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, here's where, where this goes wrong. I was telling, I hope you Gator fans will forgive me because I love Tim Tebow. I think he's a great guy. But if that verse were true, Tim Tebow would have made it in the NFL. You get it? Okay, I'm not trying to be ugly. But if I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, then I'm a superman, then he would have made it in the NFL. He, he could have been a quarterback in the NFL for an extended time through Christ who strengthens me, makes me super quarterback. But he didn't, which means, the ver that means that's not what the verse means. It's not about my strength. It is I can, but it is through Christ. It's his strength. J.B. Phillips translated Philippians 4.13 this way. I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. The living Bible the Living Bible says, I can do everything God asked me to, to with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. No matter your translation, whatever you prefer, it's all going to say the same thing. Is that, that Christ has all the power, that, I'm sorry, that, that, that the Christian has all the power he needs uh, within. The Christian has what he needs within. And it is Christ within. And it is Christ who has the strength. It is Christ's strength that can help us with everything. I can through Christ. Um, uh, you know, it's not, it's this, it's this, uh, where did I write it in my notes here? It's this thing of, uh, you know, I can do all things. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap toss buildings in a single bound. That's how that verse has been perverted. I can do all things. I can run through tackles and score a touchdown on every play, except that doesn't happen. I can slam dunk through Christ who gives me amazingly strong legs. I can't dunk an eight-foot goal, I don't think. So I, I certainly can't do a 10-foot. So that verse, that's not what that verse means. That verse is, you know what, I can be content. I can, I can be content in any situations through Christ who strengthens me. 
for every situation. Regardless of where I am in life, whatever my lot in life is right now, whatever the circumstances are, Christ strengthens me to get through it. He helps me can be content with when I have and when I don't have. Jesus taught the same lesson in the sermon uh, on the vine and branches in John 15. He says that he is the vine and we are the branches. A branch is, on, is only good for bearing fruit. Otherwise, you, have to, you ought to just burn it up. The branch does not bear fruit through its own self-effort. Okay, The branch doesn't do that, but by drawing on the life of the vine. And in, in John 15, 5, Jesus said, For without me... You can do all things with me. That's not what he said. He said, without me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing without me. So folks, our strength is nothing. This is talking about his strength. As the believer maintains his communion with Christ, the power of God is there to see him through. I can through Christ. And that's the the language of power. Christ gives us power and that, that can bring victory over every temptation. He gives us power that is grace for every trouble. He gives us power that is strength for every task. It is his strength, not my strength. And he gets us through the situations that we face in life. It's not about being superhuman. It's about God being a super God and a powerful God and an omnipotent God. He's all powerful. And whatever the circumstance in life, he can give me his strength to get through every situation. Amen? Amen. All right, Pastor Aaron and and Brother Jim, if y'all make your way forward. As we wrap this up, um, to cope with problem or prosperity, God's given us strength. We can, we can cope with problem or prosperity. We can, we can cope with feast or famine. We can cope with abundance or abasement. We can do with or without. He gives the power to enjoy contentment regardless of the circumstances. People give in and they give up because they can't cope. We can cope any situation. We can cope with Christ who gives us strength. That's contentment, folks. If you don't have contentment this morning, then then my encouragement to you is to come down here to this altar and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I, I have not yet learned fully the secret of being content. But these things that that we've heard this morning, that Paul taught us that, that about the providence of God and about the power of God. He is, he is taking care of me. Lord, help me. Teach me. Help me to learn what you want me to learn in this, that I can be content, and it's through you. I can be content with whatever the situation is, but by, by, by God's power and his strength in that situation. You may, this morning, you may have something you want to talk to the Lord about in that regard. You may want to talk to the Lord about something that has nothing to do with anything I've said this morning. I was telling them in our class this morning, I've seen, I've seen preachers preach on money and people get saved. You know what? It's the power of God and, and his word and the power of the Holy Spirit working through his word. It is his word. Even when it's talking about money, it's still God's word and it's powerful. And so this morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, I invite you to come down. Just step out. Don't worry about anybody else in this room. Worry about you and God and that relationship. If you'll step out and come down here, one of us, myself or someone else, we'll take the word of God and we'll, we'll, we'll just walk you through the gospel this morning and introduce you to Jesus Christ. But this altar is going to be open here in just a moment. And if you've got something on your heart, I encourage you to come and pray. Maybe you're still something God's dealing with in your life about from last week about peace, having that peace and trusting God and leaning on Him and not being anxious and filled with care about anything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, making all of our requests known to Him, and then we can have that peace that passes all understanding. And the peace of God will rule in our hearts and our minds through the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe that's your need this morning. Maybe you need contentment. Maybe you need salvation. Maybe you just want to come and pray for somebody. This altar's open and I invite you to step out this morning and come and deal with God about what he's dealing with you. Amen? If you'll stand with us. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Oh, it's been a blessed day through the songs that we've sung. Uh, Lord, through the, the, the time of dedicating these beautiful children back to you, giving them back to you and dedicating uh, ourselves and these families, dedicating themselves to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Thank you for the word of God that, we, that I pray, Lord, has been clearly communicated. I pray you'll take what has been preached now and you'll use it in our hearts to draw us closer to you. Lord, help us not be concerned about anybody sitting around us. But Lord, if you're dealing with our heart on anything, may we just respond to that. May, be, may we just humbly, uh, Lord, submit ourselves to you and respond to that and, and obey that by doing what it is you call us to do. If it's play, praying at the altar or getting someone to pray with us, whatever that might be, Lord, may we just respond to you now. And we'll praise you and glorify your name. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.